Hello, subscribers and others. David Hoffman, filmmaker. About to share a clip from a series I made on the 1960s in 1990. So I made it 30 years later. Well, I grew up at this time and the series that I made is about largely white kids like me, middle-class kids or people coming into the middle class in the suburbs. And I want to talk about something many of us saw in the 1950s. It sure affected me. And that was civil rights. Why did I care about civil rights? I mean, there were almost no African-American black people in my town where I lived in Levittown. There were laws against it at that time, in fact. And we got Life magazine every week in the mail. And Life magazine on the cover would show these pictures. It showed a dog biting a guy in the ass, a cop standing there smiling. It was horrible. It showed a lunch counter with kids my age trying to eat in a lunch counter and having water sprayed on them and acid sprayed on them. It was horrible. It showed a minister being kicked and knocked over. It made no sense. America was the land of the free and the home of the brave. And we were free, but these people weren't free. This was shocking. This was horrifying. And to many of us young people, civil rights seemed like what America should be about. The right of everybody to be living a decent life. And these were decent people, I could see it. So I became a civil rights advocate. I cared, millions of people cared, tens of millions of people cared when Lyndon Johnson and the Congress passed the law in favor of voting rights for everybody. That seemed right to me. In any case, I got the chance to make this little sequence for young people, people younger than me, the next generation, Gen X and even millennials, to explain just a bit about how those people felt at that time. See what you think. It certainly affected me at the time in the 50s and the 60s, and it affected me in the 1989 when I was doing these interviews. And when I see them, it still affects me today. The world was uh, consisted of right and wrong, good and evil, the free world and the Iron Curtain. We were the free world. We were the leaders of the free world. Uh, if the United States did things, then we were right. I believed that this was reality. This was the United States of America, that anybody no matter what color your skin, no matter what religion you were, what country your ancestors came from, none of that was supposed to matter. And that's what was, that's what we were told. And I believed strongly. There's something about America that's wonderful to me. And do you know what that something is? We are really free. are really free. That's what the 60s generation had been taught from birth. But they were seeing contradictory images on television, disturbing images from places like Little Rock, Arkansas. What led to the violence was black parents wanting to give their children the same good education white children were getting. This was an important part of a larger black civil rights struggle against prejudice and discrimination. For Southern black people, and for the millions of young whites who had been taught to believe in American justice and freedom, this struggle and what it said about America may be the most significant seed of the 60s. people were kept down not just by unwritten rules, but by laws backed by the full force of state and local government, the Jim Crow laws. While white parents were telling their kids to obey the rules so that prosperity and happiness would be theirs, 
black people had a very different vision of the American dream. The American dream for my particular family was survival. They did not want to do something that was going to rock the boat and interfere with the status quo. Um, I think that for them to have a job and to do anything or to have your kids do anything that would threaten the family livelihood was ridiculous. And so we stayed in our proper place. If you guys don't understand the connection that we have with the colored people. In other words, we, we work with them and they work with us. And we're not going to take him and push him off somewhere just because we could do it. The idea was that you must go to the white man, it was the statement, to get everything you need. He controls everything, and if you fight him, he's going to fight back, and he's going to hurt you, and he's going to win. Had we been your friends for years? Yes, and, sir. Sure. Had we worked more of them than anybody in this country? Yes, sir. Sure, sure have. That's right. Yeah. experience a kind of holistic oppression, find ways to develop an enclave, find ways to develop values that nurture young children so that they are not given the message and internalize the message that we are nobody. They're given a message that your life has value, that what you're about uh, is respected by, by us, even if it's not by the outside world. And they're also given one other value, a sense of dignity and a sense of mission. Education was an absolute must because you learned early that the one thing no one could take from you was, was what was in your head. So you tried to acquire as much knowledge and education was just so important. I can remember in high school teachers saying to you that you're gonna learn everything I know about this before you leave my class, you know? and. Because these teachers were also from the community, they could whoop you. <laughs> they, could, they could do anything your parents did. You know what I mean? It was, it, you, could, you could expect the same treatment that you would get at home. Even with these efforts, Southern black communities felt they were facing terrible limitations in their ability to educate their children. Black schools and white schools were separate and supposed to be equal, but everyone knew they were not. The school that we went to, we called them tar paper shacks. They were really uh, wooden buildings with tar paper on the outside and a wood stove inside. The stoves had gotten big holes in them. Uh, when they made fires in them, the hot coals would jump out. Whoever sat behind the stove, that was your job to get the coals back in so the building wouldn't burn. And at the time, you know, when you flip the coals back in, you think it's funny. But we could see that this was no no condition for learning. And um, we knew that we, we deserved something better. It was very obvious to us that what we had was not equal. And I never really realized how unequal things were until I came back here and had a chance to tour the old white school, which was then closed, and see they had all this stuff stored over there. I mean, they even had uh, they had like an open area in the center of the school, but they had a garden. I know when I went to college, first biology course I took, they handed us a microscope and slides and uh, told us to, you know, to draw amoebas. And I drew dust particles for a couple of weeks because I didn't want anybody to know I didn't know how to use a microscope because we didn't have one. So. In their struggle to give their children equal educational opportunities, black communities seized upon a revolutionary concept, school integration. When I first heard about integration and heard that it may possibly one day be the, you know, the way things would go, I 
had very mixed feelings about it. I was no more anxious to mingle with white people than I'm sure many of them were anxious to mingle with me. I felt the same reservations, the same um, prejudices, I guess I may, I may as well say, that uh, any of them felt, you know. Um, so I was not at all thrilled over the prospect. But um, as time went on, I began to realize that possibly this was, after all, the only way that the terrible injustices could be somewhat alleviated. We have been on the outside of the mainstream of America's life. We have been on the outside of society. We have been on the outside of education. In their attempt to integrate the schools, frustrated black communities sued Southern school boards. And in May 1954, in the case Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court announced its decision. Separate schools were inherently unequal. School segregation was outlawed, but there was no guarantee the white South would accept that decision. The moment a Negro child walks into the school, every decent, self-respecting, loving parent should take his white child out of that parochial school. Will the minute they walk in, that's when we walk out. Mm -hmm. And it's not right. After the Brown decision, things did not change very quickly in terms of school desegregation across the South. As a matter of fact, in many places after several years, things began to move in the opposite direction. Schools shut down across the South, particularly in Virginia. You began to see a racist backlash in the development of the White Citizens Councils, the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan in many parts of the South, and finally, the emergence of a series of very opportunistic white politicians who used the issue of school desegregation as a bloody flag or, uh, which they waved before an outraged white electorate saying segregation now and segregation forever. We shall not submit to Negro dominion another day, another hour, another month. To see just how far white communities went to sabotage school integration, consider the case of Prince Edward County, Virginia, where the local white-dominated government shut down the entire public school system, and white residents built private schools for their children. When the schools finally closed, it was like, you know, shock, disbelief. This can't be happening. You know, how, how can it happen? And it was just like, Somebody, everybody had died. Mm -hmm. Everybody had died in the community. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what to do. The kids had been locked out of school. It was a nightmare. You don't close schools to, to stop people from getting an education in the 1950s in the United States of America, the, 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 the country that, that, that advocates democracy for everyone all over the world, and you're going to close schools to keep from integrating, I mean, that, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. It doesn't gel. That's, you know, that's how I felt, and that's where I still feel. It was white resistance to a Supreme Court ruling, to the law of the land, to what black people saw as the surest path to equality that inspired the Southern black community, and especially young black people, to fight back. And that battle played a major role in making the 60s what they were. The only thing out there in the society that gave one any hope that, that, that gave me any hope that I could do anything with the feelings that were mine and so different from anything else and that couldn't exist in a gray flannel suit was the Negroes, okay? These people way over there, down, they were down south, they weren't in my county, but on the television comes these pictures of these black kids in the compounds down south with the dogs at them, with the hoses on them, you know? 
Good God, it was just, it was unbelievable. Here were people standing up for something that was vital to them, that was right for them as citizens, moving, f saying no to what they had been and yes to what was promised them and what was inside them. And it, it just, it sliced across the face of the American reality. We grew up in a, in, in a time when none of the adults would take a chance 